Hello, everyone. Welcome to a special session of uh, what's a library if the building is closed. This is a focus. Uh, the, the title here is Beyond the Parking Lot, uh, a special session here. It's Thursday. We normally do this on Friday, as you would mostly be aware. Uh, but this is a, a, a pressing topic that is a remarkable culmination of a lot of time and a lot of years and a lot of effort by a lot of people to do this, what now looks like uh, there will be funds, substantial funds to, to actually make serious progress on. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. Uh, we're based in California. Uh, we're producing these series, uh, which are uh, hosted and recorded by our partner, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions based in The Hague with our uh, trusted partner, Stephen Weiber, the head of public policy for IFLA at the controls there. Our session sponsor today is uh, Kelly Dry Warren, LLP, uh, DC, eminent DC law firm. And uh, uh, Stephen Augustino is uh, with us today. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, we appreciate the support. So uh, this is our panel today. We've got three amazing people who know more about this stuff than, than probably the rest of us combined. At least they have a way of describing this information that uh, is, is really essential right now as we try to deal with this, this opportunity and challenge. Uh, we have a general agenda for the, for the session today. Uh, you know, what, what are the opportunities that the, uh, that the act and the, the $7.1 billion for extending access really represent? And what are the issues to be resolved? I mean, Congress has said, yeah, here, use this money to do that, but not how to do it. They only said, well, yeah, use the E-rate uh, program. But then they also made uh, changes to, to the rules in the law and how the FCC would, would administer that. But there's still quite a bit to be uh, determined. This will be kind of the first part. And then the second part will be, well, what kind of actions will, uh, should we be uh, looking at uh, and, and taking or preparing to take right now? So we don't actually know the details of this. We know there's some things we can presume are going to be the case. And if those pres presumptions turn out, there are then specific actions uh, that we might take if we're so motivated. And I hope we are because this is a load of money to spend to do what we've been trying to do for so long. Well, how to do that, how to get ready for that. And so that's our basic outline. So with that, I will um, stop the share here and uh, ask John Windhausen, the executive director of the Schools, Health and Libraries Broadband Coalition, our, our trusty uh, partner in so many things, to give us uh, context for, for what this is, what this, uh, uh, what, what, are the, what are the political considerations? What are the key outstanding issues? You can see John's slide up there. So John, welcome. Uh, why don't you take us through that and set us up? Well, thanks, Don. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, you characterize this exactly right, Don. We've been trying to convince the FCC for several years to allow E-rate funding to be used for off-campus activities. And the previous FCC declined to do that. Uh, it said that the law didn't allow them to do that. Uh, we actually had a different opinion about the law. And uh, in January of this year, uh, Shelby Coalition filed a petition with the FCC asking it to make funding available for off-campus use and cited the legal precedents that we could muster. And the FCC put that out for comment. And then lo and behold, Congress, uh, kind of took the bull by the horns and ended up um, appropriating $7 billion for that very purpose. So how wonderful. I mean, you're exactly right. This is a huge opportunity. Um, having said that, it's very exciting. But having said that, it's only $7 billion. 
And even though that sounds like a heck of a lot of money compared to the traditional E-rate program, which has been handing out around $2.8, $2.9 billion per year, um, this $7 billion uh, could go pretty quickly once you start trying to use it to fund off-campus uh, broadband connections. And keep in mind that the uh, legislation says not just funding the connections, but also it funds the devices, uh, this, the end user devices at home, which the E-rate program has never done before. And also keep in mind the legislation says that it will provide 100% of the funding for the connections and the devices. So it doesn't use the traditional E-rate match uh, requirement for schools and libraries. So, that means there are a whole host of questions now about how is the FCC going to decide how to allocate that $7 billion. So we have all of these questions here that I'm, I'm really happy to participate in this panel with Bob and John Harrington, because I think John, you agreed we're gonna have like an old fashioned conversation about these issues. Um, so I'm gonna try not to spend a whole lot of time on a official presentation, but really I just wanted to highlight some of the key issues that we want to talk about today. So uh, the first issue is a really big issue as far as we're concerned. Um, will the uh, funding be allowed to be used to fund new network deployments? We're seeing a lot of libraries uh, uh, deploy uh, CBRS equipment, private LTE schools as well. Uh, but there's a suggestion in the FCC's public notice that it will not fund new construction. Now, they use the word construction. You know, what does that mean? Is that trying to refer just to fiber digging up the, the roads? Or are they also suggesting no new deployment uh, of antennas? Well, we know how the uh, traditional cable and telephone companies are uh, and 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 wireless companies are trying to say that should be only fund existing services, nothing new. Well, that doesn't really help those consumers that don't have any broadband provider today. So that's an open question. How much of the funding will be available for retroactive reimbursement is a big question. A lot of schools and libraries you know, did the right thing back in March of 2020 and started to you know, pay for uh, broadband connectivity right away when schools and libraries shut down. So should they be reimbursed for that expense? But if you give everything to the reimbursement, there might not be much left over for uh, proactive or uh, prospective rather uh, service going forward. So that's an open question. Should the FCC use a budget formula? We're gonna get into this. John Harrington has really been the leader uh, in articulating the, the value of a budget and the Shelby Coalition has uh, endorsed that idea at the high level because it solves a lot of the problems that we're talking about. But but the FCC did not um, get into that yet. They haven't decided. How much funding should be allocated for libraries? Uh, we hope more money goes to libraries than in the traditional E-rate program where libraries get four to 5% of the funding. Um, but how much will go to libraries? We don't know. Will the fund, what funding window, when will that take place? We expect the FCC to issue rules in May. Uh, my count of their 60 days is May 10th. So will they then set up an application window in June? And how long, 30 or 45 days, we don't know. Will the FCC limit the amount of funding for end user devices? Um, one of the commenters at the FCC suggested that if you take the average price of an end user device and multiply that times the number of students, you already come to $7 billion just to fund the devices and with nothing left over to fund the broadband connectivity. So will the FCC put a limit on how much funding can go to the end user devices? Will smartphones be eligible um, is, an, is an open question. Will cybersecurity filtering and other ancillary services be eligible? You know, US Telecom said, don't expand the eligible services list, just keep it to existing services. Oh, but you ought to fund the cybersecurity because that's an important adjunct to your service. So. People are being, you know, have two different mindsets about whether how expansive uh, the, the funding should go. And then will the funding be restricted only to services that serve educational purposes? Well, Don, as you mentioned, the funding goes through the E-rate program, which has an educational purposes part of the statute. Some people are saying this funding should only go to connect uh, 
uh, students and library patrons to go through the school and library networks, uh, but not for general internet access. Others are saying, well, that's ridiculous. You ought to be able to get that broadband connection and use it for whatever you need to because there's so many other valuable uses of the internet. So these are just some of the issues. Um, and just to, to recap the political situation, Don, that you referred to, um, the FCC right now has a two to two split, two Democrats, two Republicans. So in order to meet the congressional deadline of getting an order adopted in 60 days, uh, they need to, uh, the, the Democratic chairwoman, uh, Jessica Rosenworcel, needs to bring at least one of the two Republicans on board. So that limits how creative the FCC might be willing to be because they really do have to find consensus probably with all four of the commissioners voting together as they did with the EBB program uh, last month. So a lot of these questions are going to, you know, not just be the decision of the chair, uh, they need to be decided by all four FCC commissioners. So that's gonna be the challenge. How do they collectively decide to answer these questions? So with that done, I'll, I'll turn it back to you and our other esteemed panelists. Thank you, John. Sorry, I'm having some issues here. Uh, yeah, so you can stop your screen share, and uh, that's a great that's a great overview. And uh, so we'll go to uh, we'll we'll go to uh, John uh, Harrigan uh, Harrington, excuse me, John, uh, to kind of help us uh, get a hold of, you know, the mechanics of all these, uh, uh, these possibilities. So, uh, John, take us away. Uh, yeah, and I don't know, uh, Bob Boker, if you want to sort of jump in. John, here you're up. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Hey, Bob, do you want to, you want to kind of start? Um, do you want to go first? Sure, sure. Uh, when we were looking at dividing up the responsibilities here, folks, I agreed to take uh, on looking at the comments that were filed by the carriers or the providers. And there were about 20, 25 comments filed, uh, not just specifically by the providers as individual entities or companies, but also by their various associations uh, in this particular proceeding. So I thought what I would do just quickly go through some of the main uh, points that a number of the carriers made. You know, from the bidding perspective, folks will recall that the FCC said, if you, the school or library, already have a contract, for example, for Wi-Fi hotspots, you can use that contract and don't have to go out and rebid it uh, in relationship to the emergency connectivity funds. But if you don't have a contract, you'll have to go through some type of bidding process. And they were proposing a 14-day process. And a number of the providers also uh, supported this in part to deal with the concerns about waste, fraud, and abuse. AT&T, for example, said that with no skin in the game and with 100% of the cost reimbursed, the FCC should require applicants to conduct a fair and open competitive bidding process, again, primarily to deal with concerns about waste, fraud, and abuse. U.S. Seller, sell, sell, joined the meeting. That said, uh, maintaining the existing bidding system, you know, is the best way to approach uh, the need for, you know, Wi-Fi hotspots or any other form of connectivity that you might be applying for. And then WTA, that's a, uh, a trade association that advocates for rural broadband, said also that it makes good sense really to have a streamlined competitive bidding process, but nonetheless do have a competitive bidding process. Now of interest from the opposite perspective, I did see that T-Mobile, one of the larger uh, uh, cell phone companies in the country said that schools and libraries should not be required to, to uh, process competitive bids saying that would just slow down the process and we have to get these funds out the door. So uh, that was the only competitor uh, and provider that I saw that specifically said uh, there should be no competitive bidding process. A couple of other uh, comments in relationship to hotspots, folks who will recall that Wi-Fi hotspots are definitely one of the eligible pieces of equipment that schools and libraries can apply for. And T-Mobile said that, you know, these Wi-Fi hotspots are critical in emergency as an emergency option really for households, especially during the pandemic as far as the form of connectivity. But of interest, an organization uh, known as NTCA, and that's a rural broadband association of about 850 providers, again, representing primarily the rural communities, uh, said that no 
uh, emergency connectivity funds should go to houses uh, for with hotspots. What they were really focusing on was not to prevent a household from getting access, but saying if there is a form of wireline connectivity, for instance, maybe a local cable provider or a more traditional phone company uh, in that neighborhood that can provide access, instead of providing a hotspot that uh, to that household, uh, applicants should be working with these providers to get more direct and long-term connectivity. So, so that was kind of an interesting point of view. Uh, from the smartphone perspective, folks might recall in the notice that the FCC proposed not to fund smartphones, saying in part that they simply lack the robust connectivity needed uh, to allow students, for example, to do a schoolwork at home. And especially from the screen size perspective, they weren't large enough from uh, that perspective to allow decent home learning to take place. But, you know, you might expect most of the carriers, especially the wireless and the cell phone carriers, we're all in favor of allowing smartphones to be eligible for discounts. And in fact, uh, US Cellular, almost most of their comments, several pages of comments were all devoted to justifying or rationalizing why cell phones should be a viable option and should be eligible for funding. Uh, in relationship to speed, again, a number of carriers commented on that and the FCC made a comment, uh, you know, does their standard uh, 25 down, three back up, megs back up, make any sense? Is that viable? Should it be changed in some fashion? And U.S. Cellular again said that, well, you, the FCC, should not really hold providers to this in certain areas of the country. For example, it may simply be impossible to meet that uh, speed level, even though it's a fairly low level, for example, in rural areas. However, the Fiber Broadband Association, their only issue for the most part was a suggestion that the 25.3 was way too slow and that the FCC should set a threshold of 100 megs up and 100 megs down. I'm personally doubtful whether the FCC is going to do that, but uh, this was an organization really that was pushing for much higher speeds than the 25.3 that we currently have. A lot of other organizations made comments, for example, in relationship to streamlining the application process if an application process was needed, uh, not weighing down these applications with all kinds of other E-rate rules and regulations that apply to the current program. Quite a few uh, providers, you know, reference the need to not get bogged down in all of these details. Uh, two other areas I want to quickly mention here, then I'll turn the program back over to Don or John, is on the privacy issue. Uh, again, in the notice, the FCC is proposing to require schools and libraries to not only record which patrons, for example, check out a Wi-Fi hotspot, but when that hotspot is returned, and then to make that data available down to the individual household or individual uh, person to the FCC or to USAC when they request it. Uh, this is obviously from a library privacy perspective, I would want to follow of most of the states that have library privacy laws in both the Competitive Carriers Association and again, WTA, which is a rural broadband association came out saying that uh, this was too intrusive for the FCC to uh, require all of this data be available to them upon demand in relationship to households that uh, we're getting access and individuals that we're getting access. And then one more quick point I'll mention, uh, this is of importance, especially from the library perspective, and that's the Children's Internet Protection Act. ALA has been adamantly opposed to SIPA since its inception way back in about 2000, 2001. And there was only one organization, Verizon, that said, uh, if the FCC finds that SIPA uh, requirements are needed for the connectivity fund, it should consider at least making the cost of the SIPA filtering products eligible for those funds. And right now, people know in the traditional E-rate program, program uh, the, the cost, cost of complying, complying with SIPA and purchasing your filtering, your filtering uh, is not eligible. So Don and John, those are quick updates uh, that I have in relationship to some of the comments that the providers made. And I'll turn the program back over to you folks. Yeah, I can, uh, I can, uh, uh, can maybe get feedback from someone. Uh, go ahead, John. OK, great. Let me uh, give you just kind of a, a, a quick run through of what we saw on the uh, school library side of things. Uh, much of it sort of follows and tracks with what Bob's described. So uh, I'll just kind of try to highlight some of the differences. Uh, now, uh, you know, as, as Bob mentioned, there were quite a few comments submitted. Uh, as of this morning, I, I saw 107 uh, different uh, comments submitted into the docket specifically providing you know, insights, feedback. Uh, most of those are from large players. So 
either on the service provider side or on, on the education side, we see uh, large school districts, uh, Miami-Dade, New York, LA, uh, uh, some of the large cities uh, weighing in on this, and then many of the associations. Uh, obviously, you know, John Windhausen here today from Shelby, uh, Council of Great City Schools, uh, the EdLink, uh, the Consortium for School Networking, uh, many of those organizations all weighing in, as you would expect. Uh, the, uh, the, if you just sort of survey all of those comments, uh, there seems to be some very consistent themes. Uh, the, uh, the word equity comes up a lot. Uh, the uh, word, uh, the prioritization of funding towards uh, communities with higher degrees of poverty. I think there's a great uh, a great consensus around those basic principles uh, in terms of how the funds should be uh, allocated, weighted. Uh, there are a few, uh, there's really two mindsets as it comes to prioritizing the applications. And, and that comes down to either using the, the discount threshold system uh, that you may recall from the, the prior a priority two system that was a part of the E-rate program. Uh, uh, internal connections applications were uh, sorted, prioritized based on the discount rate of an applicant, the highest discount rate applicants receiving a first priority. And there is a, uh, a number of applicants or number of comments submitted in support of that. Uh, most, uh, most notably, the uh, EdLink uh, Coalition uh, Los Angeles Unified, both uh, uh, supporting that. I would say the majority of the comments, though, weight towards using a category two type budget system uh, for uh, allowing all applicants to receive some support, but uh, for most of the support to be weighted towards communities with the highest levels of poverty. Uh, as I read through and scanned so many of the comments, uh, I really felt like there's uh, if, if, if there was an election today, that would seem to be the overall uh, mood of the, 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 uh, the universe uh, here of our ed tech uh, uh, community. Of course, you know, what the FCC uh, receives and how they filter it is still a big question. So I think uh, in terms of letting the FCC know that that's a good uh, approach, uh, it's probably uh, that that battle has not been won yet, so to speak. Uh, and it's important in this in the reply comment period to have an op have the opportunity to kind of get on record with the FCC in support of that budget system. If 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 that's where you're at, one of one of the things that really struck me in looking at the comments, and it's not unusual, and not even altogether unexpected, uh, is just the the lack of uh, comments from kind of the, 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 the everyday, you know, the, the library here, the library there. I think that especially when the FCC is receiving comments, there are sort of the standard actors, the, the folks that they expect to hear that they'd be more surprised not to hear from. Uh, and so not that those, they don't look at those, of course they do, but I think when a, when an individual library takes the time to submit a comment, I believe that those stand out in a different way uh, than, than some of those other comments that the FCC is expecting. And I would hope to see uh, in this next round of reply comments that are due April 23rd, that, that there would be more uh, voices from the field, those direct stories. Uh, I think that the, the one area that maybe is not represented as much in the comments is really the eligible services list. Uh, the A uh, lot of focus on how the funds should be prioritized, which is important. Perhaps not as much uh, emphasis on the, the issue of the, what services should qualify for support. Should there be the opportunity to purchase equipment or to expand uh, the backbone networks to support those end users? And I think that my general sense of reading the comments and having had conversations with the FCC is not that the battle is won on how things should be prioritized, but uh, I, I think that there's probably more work that now needs to be done on really educating the FCC 
about some of the applications, uh, some of those use cases in which uh, a, a Wi-Fi hotspot is not uh, the, the best solution. And I think some of, uh, Don, some of the uh, opportunities you, you've even talked about and, and Megan today for uh, unique uh, solutions to address, uh, to address the homework gap in communities. That is where I think the FCC docket today needs, there's more information that could really help fill out that, that docket in terms of the, this is why we need to be able to purchase equipment. This is why we can't just turn towards uh, the local cellular company for Wi-Fi hotspots as the solution. And I, that, that is what I think is probably lacking and not, not it's, it's there in the record, but there's, I don't think there's a critical mass of that yet to really help the FCC understand that this is not just a, a Wi-Fi hotspot subsidy program. There is a place for that. Uh, we already have the EBV program, uh, but that's, so I'm, I'm more concerned today about what's, what's not in the docket as much as what's in the docket. And that's around the eligibility of goods and services. So let's hand it back to you, Don. That's a great setup. Um, a couple of things jumped out uh, in the comments just made. One is uh, uh, John Windhausen's point about the proportion of uh, E-rate funds in general and perhaps this special fund uh, as it's shared between libraries and schools. We know there are eight times as many school facilities as library facilities. But uh, we also know that libraries utilize, what was that number, John? Uh, 4%, something like that? Four to 5%, yes, four to five percent. yeah. Where, you know, proportionally speaking, uh, it could, should be closer to 12%. Uh, hey, if John, I've actually got a slide here that shows the uh, amount of yeah. E-rate funding that libraries have received historically looking back at the last 10 years and you can see it's sort of been in the 75 to 100 million dollar range, the applications, the total requests. Uh, this year, uh, the uh, requested amount is around uh, 85 million or so. Uh, and uh, it's a significant amount of money. But as you say, uh, you know, there's that's a small percentage when you look at the overall three billion dollar uh, fund uh, that or the three billion dollar demand that we've seen uh, year to year. Right. Well, thanks. Thanks for that one. And uh, as as Bob Boker has pointed out, that that uh, libraries don't even take advantage of that. They don't even spend the amount that's that's available to them. Uh, we think this is a crying shame. Uh, there is no reason that there's not every opportunity and reason for libraries to take advantage of, uh, of uh, regular E-rate funds and uh, and especially now, especially now. Uh, and we'll get into the, the action segment of our agenda here in a moment. We've been doing the setup. What are the issues? Uh, that's certainly one. What would be an appropriate sort of pot to allocate for libraries to, to serve the purpose of the law? Uh, also, the short, uh, short term, uh, near term versus long term. You know, it's, it's an emergency act. So you don't usually think about you know, long-term health, if you're bleeding to death, you know, you want to stop the bleeding. But at the same time, we've been in this for a while now. And, and so it's not like a year ago. If they'd done this a year ago, yeah, it would be like, what can we do today? Well, we've pretty much wasted a year. Uh, we could have been doing a lot of things. So we're going to, we should be thinking a little bit longer term, how to get more uh, return on this, uh, their near-term investments. What kind of benefits can the infrastructure have from these as opposed to just uh, uh, paying for uh, temporary services it seems to me to be a, uh, an element of it. And also with regard to uh, SIPA, I mean, if that's required, that's enabling technology. So it'd be, it would just negate the ability to use these funds if you had to, uh, if you had to have that, but you weren't allowed to spend money to, to implement filtering. So that seemed like an obvious thing. You also set up our actions, which is what I think we want to move into now, uh, which really take kind of two categories. One is uh, what kind of responses. And we didn't actually set up the time window, I think, that 
the, the reply period is open right now. We've been talking about the comments that came in, had to come in by the 5th of April. And so now we have until April the 23rd to reply to those comments. And then, as you say, there's that period, John, where John Windhouse is where they will have to uh, uh, digest all of that and issue actual implementation uh, rules, which is just an astounding challenge uh, for the FCC, but the law says they have to do it. So that certainly tends towards simplification and streamlining, which we all want, but we'll see if that's how that's possible and, and remain, and remain uh, somewhat uh, fair and equitable. Uh, the other action line, uh, so that's one, you know, how, can we, how can we influence those decisions? We, as a, as a community of interest of, of libraries and our, and our sister organizations to schools, how can we influence those, those decisions in, in filing? And uh, we've actually decided that, that what, what John Harrington was just saying is that uh, they always expect uh, Shelby and Sika and you know, all the councils and associations to file. They always file. It'd be more uh, amazing if they didn't file. But what also stands out, and, and John Harrington, you made the point well, are voices of individual practitioners. You know, these are the things that we're doing. These have helped. This is why it's helped. This is what we think should be uh, taken into consideration setting these rules. And, and so that, uh, that we can get into as a mechanism. And we're planning to do that next Friday at our regular scheduled session a week from tomorrow to have a workshop on filing that is really not that complicated. And it, it's really valuable for the people that don't usually file to file. And so that's going to be the focus of a week from Friday. The other action line is what kinds of things can libraries do now to prepare for what looks like it's coming? What kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, plans to, to actually implement uh, these uh, are available? And so I'm going to provide a quick... Um, run through of last, we've done these. There are prior sessions we've spent on this topic. You can see them on the, on the pandemic response page at giglibraries.net. Uh, what I'm gonna touch on right now, we spent most of an hour on uh, a week or two ago. And so there are two sessions, not to mention Shelby's excellent session, which is also recorded, but I don't know if that's available to non-Shelby members, John Windhausen, but it's, it's a really great session that you did. No, Those are all good. Thank you. Yeah. Those are all linked in the registration if you read down to the bottom. So take advantage of those. So this is the setup. So for the importance of libraries in playing this role, providing information, educational services, before the COVID hit us, uh, there were 80 million people, roughly 80 million people went to the library and relied either entirely or, or partially on libraries for internet access. But they had to be at just one of those 17,000 locations. The choices now are the parking lot or a checkout hotspot, or there are, uh, well, this was what we did uh, a year ago. Immediately, we turned the signal out the window and, and, and amped it up. The FCC stepped in and said, yeah, you can cover the parking lot and the property. Go right ahead, leave it on all the time if, you, if you're willing to. And so now a year later, beyond that, that's what this whole act is about, reaching farther from the institutions, the libraries and the schools to reach people. And this is basically what we think should be the goal, is everybody should be within a, a, a easy access, a close distance to a, to a library access point, a, a station, a service point, a point of presence, if you will. And uh, that since they have to go to the library to get this service, this, this critical public service, because people that don't have any access, they totally rely on the library. It's not just for Netflix, it's for all public information, public services that people have to. We don't think about that much, how valuable that is for people to have to fill out public government forms and, and uh, submit, uh, well, school work, for example. And on the phone, I think, you know, we all kind of agree it's really difficult to write a two page paper on your phone. So it's, I think we should agree it's inadequate to serve the needs of students in general. Um, so here are just some kind of examples of these 
locations where libraries could set up a, a point of presence. It could look like this. It could be in a city hall. It could be uh, a community center. This is a, uh, a situation where a, a wireless direct connection back to the library to the community center in, in a, uh, a community center in, in Manhattan, Kansas. Uh, you can set these up in, in uh, laundromats, a really good place where people go that they have time uh, and would benefit from such an access service. Uh, this is our this is our favorite image here. This is a, 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 a town in Tennessee. I forget the name, but they set these up. They set a couple of these up, you know, solar powered picnic tables with charging stations and, and even a little library there. That, that's that's a cool outlet for a library. Um, so here's a, a general scan of technologies and service models as we've been able to experience them and support them as a template just for things to consider if you're trying to think about what you're going to do other than just buy more hotspots. By the way, hotspot, that used to mean uh, a Wi-Fi access router. It didn't mean a checkout hotspot. It does now. It seems like we've just appropriated hotspot for checkouts. Well, fixed locations are actually hotspots, but I'll allow that. Okay, we'll go with the current, the current technology. But these are these are four example projects that we've been able to support out of IMLS grants, and uh, the 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 first one there in Georgia is a typical TV white space. It's long range technology, but it's a it's a, a DIY service model. So the, the library is the hub and they use this uh, open spectrum to extend signals and support remote stations. They did it themselves. There's no third parties involved and it's just equipment. As uh, John would say, it's to and through the library. It's fiber to the library and wireless through the library. And we think that is uh, brilliant. Uh, 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 Pottsboro, Texas is a different, a different model, a different uh, technology, this EBS. I'm not going to get into all these. We've done that in the past. You can go back and look, but that's a, that's a licensed type of spectrum that certain people have. Mostly they are, have been uh, sublet to, uh, to commercial providers. And in Pottsboro, it's a local WISP and they're part of the community and they want to help with this, the school priority to connect these students. And so the the, the library has helped the school identify locations where students can be uh, supported in aggregate, as opposed to just trying to reach every student. They have reached many students, but the service doesn't go everywhere. So in other places, they've set up uh, homework hotspots, kind of hubs for students to go to. Um, and so that was a partnership uh, with the ISP in collaboration with the school systems, which have originally licensed EBS to the, to the provider. In Plymouth, Nebraska, this is one of our favorite uh, examples. The schools generally are very well wired. Nearly all the schools now have high capacity backhaul. The, the libraries, especially the small town libraries, have squat for, for broadband. Usually it's, you know, they're a department of the city government. They have, a, you know, here's a little bit of the, of the poor bandwidth we have for the city, and you can stick your router on it. Well, uh, in Plymouth, Nebraska, a town of 400, they have 46 K-12 students who have had to drive four miles to the school parking lot to, to get their license plan and turn in their homework. What the school has done is to set up a, a, a microwave, a five gigahertz microwave link that shoots to the water tower in New Plymouth, Nebraska. It then spreads down to four library locations in the town, which is pretty small. Most of these rural towns are actually small areas of where most people live close together, you know, maybe a mile across or less. Uh, even as we look at the density of the county, we see it's really small. Most people seem to live close together in these small towns, which lends itself to certain kind of wireless and even mesh solutions. That was a great school uh, partnership. And another one is another school partnership. Something we're really advocating right now is to seek partnership with schools that have capacity and they have uh, IT skills to help you build these things out, at least explore it. In Castleberry, Texas, it's a CBRS. They're building their own wireless network, mobile wireless, you know, C an LTE network to connect all the students at the, at the school district. This is in Tarrant County, uh, Fort Worth County. And so the school has partnered with the local library to use the same technology to support fixed stations in these places like we've described in the examples. 
So it's a really low bar if you're doing something as sophisticated as setting up a, you know, a, a, a system to support all your students to support a few homework hotspots. So I'll, I'll kind of finish with this kind of cost model. I don't know if we can call it that, but at one end, just talking in dollars, one end, this is a, this is a kind of a goal, arbitrary goal of 100,000 new neighborhood hotspots or access stations. Uh, really more or less one in every neighborhood depends on the definition I know, but it's a, it's a number within an, at least an order of magnitude of being correct and, and also of great value. So you don't have to travel by bus to the library to sit in the parking lot in inclement weather. You can walk a few blocks to a shelter someplace in your neighborhood and access the same service. That seems to be up to us to be a smart move, especially given the low cost of doing it. If we use actually the checkout hotspots to support those kind of stations, you know, something like $500 for 24 months is, is sort of a number that's out there for these hotspots. You could set you could support 100,000 neighborhood access stations with those kinds of, that kind of technology for only $50 million. Uh, it's, we can't do this as a national goal because every individual facility and, and library system has to uh, apply on their own. But if they all did and they use this approach, we could go pretty far just using that. Alternatively, in the examples I gave earlier, use these more these fixed wireless solutions, which are more robust and the equipment is, is more expensive. But even that, let's just say 10 times more expensive we could still do 100,000 of these at around 5,000 per. And I'll, I'll sit down with anybody that thinks that's, that's too low to set up one of these stations with you know, good capacity. Uh, and that's only $500 million. So well, this is our bid. I moved into the second portion, the, as John Herring could call it, the fair and balanced portion. This is the balanced portion where we can advocate for things. So this is GLN sort of advocacy that this is a, this would be an excellent use of these funds for a portion, actually a very small a minor portion of these funds to do what libraries do, which is provide shared resources. That's the library principle, you know, that you pool resources and you acquire things and you share them on a limited basis. Not everybody gets a book all the time, but they can take turns sharing it. Not everybody gets a home access station, but they can go to the library or they can go to a neighborhood station and share a limited version of that. And so this is, this is, in our view, both a supplement to satisfying the needs of these 15 million students and learners of any age, as far as that goes, as well as um, being a, a, an intermediate solution, a partial solution, if you will, something can be done most quickly compared to build, doing this full build out and would also actually have a physical, uh, a contribution to physical infrastructure, which is what we want if we're thinking long term. So I am going to step off the soapbox here and uh, open it uh, back up to uh, ideas for action and preparation. Um, let's see what kind of questions we got here, Bob. More public relation efforts, absolutely, Bob. Uh, yes, as I commented to uh, Wynn's uh, question there, uh, certainly some libraries are going to be working with their internet service providers on the emergency broadband benefit program, but I think the majority of those are going to be doing what they often do, oh, for example, in relationship to getting information out on uh, tax issues during tax time, this time of the year, providing brochures, providing PR information, maybe doing workshops, maybe helping households fill out applications and things of that nature. But I think where you'll see more cooperation on the EBB program with ISPs is more likely on the school side of things than on the library side of things. That's the usual case, right? Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to pull in our buddy, Steve Agostino and see Steve, uh, how well your crystal ball's working. You know, the, is it a, is it a fool's errand for us to be talking about extending networks, purchasing, you know, uh, wireless antennas and things to extend the network? Uh, I mean, I think there's there's so much discussion around that. Uh, what do you what is your sense at the FCC if that's even a possibility? Let me reintroduce Steve Stephen uh, uh, Kelly Dry, his firm. 
uh, is our is our sponsor today and has helped us with a prior filing and and is setting up to help anyone with a filing. And so uh, we go to to Augustino to help us understand what's happening. So please, Steve, welcome and thank you. And and what's the reality from where you sit? Well, well, thank you all. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, all right, good. Um, yeah, no, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I, I really enjoyed the, um, the updates you guys have had. I haven't had a chance to get as deep into the comments as, as you guys have been. Um, but generally, this question about supporting um, new builds and networks has been very, very controversial. It does generate a lot of opposition from the existing broadband service providers who say, well, I can do that, or I would do that under the right circumstances on there. And, you know, we had previous commissioners, we had at least one who was very concerned about overbuilding and public support for what, what he termed overbuilding. So um, I think it's, it's difficult. It's probably made more difficult by the environment that you guys pointed out that we have for this, um, only four commissioners. So uh, Acting Chairwoman Rosenworcel has to find support from at least one of the two Republicans to get the majority necessary. So usually that means that you focus on the easier issues and not the ones that have, um, have significant opposition. So I would think it's probably gonna be hard in this time frame to get something through. Interesting, uh, though it's, <laughs> it's unclear what, what the term building a network actually means. I mean, setting up a router is in effect building a network, right? Right. So setting up two routers, setting up a router that goes out in the parking lot, you know, it just, there's no, there's no hard dividing line between just extending your, your uh, the wirelessly extending your service and extending it farther. Okay, building towers, I admittedly, that you can certainly call that construction, but uh, a lot of people are, are doing things like that today, so. No, I, well, the other thing is that while not required, right, the EBB order was released as a 4-0, um, you know, as a unanimous decision. I think for optics, the chairwoman would like that here as well. So anything that ends up creating, you know, at least one holdout might be something that they try to avoid in this order. Mm, mm. Uh, a bargaining chip, as it were. Yeah. Mm, that's good. A good point. I mean, we should be practical, or realistic about this, but I think we should reach as far as we can uh, to accomplish as much as possible. Lots of good stuff coming in here. John, uh, if I could jump in. Yeah, John. Yeah, just to make the point that, um, a political point, that when uh, the, the members of Congress were trying to get this emergency connectivity funding through the Congress, um, they needed to do so quickly and with the least amount of opposition possible. So they made a calculation that they wanted to identify hotspots because that's what the major cellular companies wanted to see. And they identified cable modems because that's what the cable companies wanted to see. And so that took away their potential opposition to this new funding. Um, and so I understand that as a legislative matter, uh, but it's also true that the legislation says this uh, uh, eligible equipment means these things. It doesn't say it only means these things. And we have, to, in fact, there's house report language that we were able to get into the congressional record that encourages the FCC to explore using any potential technology possible. And that's really what, how the FCC should come out and read this statute in a, in, in a flexible way that allows libraries to use whatever technology suits their needs for that local market. But we are facing pressure from the other side, meaning the established companies. They've already, even before the comments were filed, the telcos were into the FCC commissioners saying this funding should only go for existing services. Well, that's not in the legislation. That's not in the statute, but that's the hurdle 
that we're going to have to overcome in order to get additional deployments to be eligible for funding. And it really, as several people have said, it's really going to depend on how many commenters come in and file in the reply comment round to support that concept. You know, when Shelby filed our initial comments, we attached an appendix of about 20 examples of libraries and schools using wireless technologies to extend their service and, and cover new deployments. So now we need to hear more from the you know, community, from those libraries that are actually doing this. If you wanna get funding for it, you're gonna to have to weigh in with the FCC in order to convince the FCC to take that route. Exactly. And John, so, if I can just quickly comment on that, you know, John is right in relationship to that specific list in the Act on Wi-Fi uh, equipment, routers, and so forth. You know, one of the ways to look at this also, and the FCC asks this, is that the law uh, allows for the funding of advanced telecommunication and information services, the latter information services, meaning internet access. And in right. the notice, they specifically ask, should we, the FCC, then support the underlying equipment and technologies that provide for advanced services and information access. And in the, in the ALA comments, we said, absolutely, you should do that. Otherwise, I mean, if you don't support the underlying technologies, then no one's going to have access. I mean, it renders that whole clause, the important clause in the act, uh, meaningless. Good point. And uh, um, the, the eligibility list is, is a key question, outstanding question, uh, as you make. Uh, the point, John Windhausen. Um, uh, I think Steve wants to jump in. Yeah. I, I got one more point just to, to I, I agree, you know, that comments are good and, and having more people express what they want to see. Um, keep in mind that thanks to, to Shelby and others, there is also a pending petition to change the E-rate rules. So you have both the ECF, the emergency rules, and a, a vehicle for broader rule changes as well. Either or both of those could be done and perhaps one now and one a little bit later. So this is a viable issue. It should be raised. My point was, I think that in the ECF, they're probably gonna try to narrow that to as much consensus as they can get. Yeah, very, very likely. Uh, what, what's the value, uh, you know, we talk about writing letters from you know, practitioners and associations. What's the role of Congress in providing additional, you know, as individual members and in providing influence or, or recommendations to the FCC? Are they, do they have a voice in this? John Windhausen? Well, sure. Congress often writes letters to the FCC expressing their views about the topics. Um, and, and that could happen, you know, we could see that again, where the incumbent providers uh, corral members of Congress to write a letter on their behalf saying, keep this very narrow. Um, we might do, make our own effort to generate some Hill letters, uh, taking the approach that suggesting that the FCC should take a broader interpretation of this language so that more different kinds of technologies should be eligible for funding. Um, it's always harder for the new entrants uh, to marshal congressional support. The incumbents are often bigger and have more political influence, but yet it's the smaller innovative players that are really the ones that are forward looking for developing the most uh, adept technologies at lower prices, better technology. And, and there really should be an effort from Congress to recognize the value of these new, newer, and especially these wireless technologies that you articulated, Don, that can do enormous good for communities that don't have any broadband provider today. And if there's no broadband provider out there, why should you limit the funding to existing services if there aren't any existing services? Right. So we hope the FCC would at least recognize, okay, if there's nobody in that market, allow this uh, uh, equipment to be eligible for funding uh, because nobody else is gonna do it if the libraries or schools don't do it. Uh, exactly so. And you know, it's a general truism that the technology gets simpler and cheaper. I mean, also it gets more sophisticated, but some portion of it continues to get simpler. And that is really what has set us up for all these do-it-yourself uh, uh, wireless networks. It's just doable and, and it's practical because you have so much more control. It doesn't mean it's superior. It just means it's one way to go about it. So I agree. I think we should do a little corralling of our own here 
because uh, there are certainly sympathetic people in, in the House and Senate to this uh, that maybe are not under the sway of uh, traditional models, uh, which have proven to be ineffective at reaching everybody. I think, before it's important, I think it's important to point out too, just timing matters, you know, and the lay of the land and the momentum and the winds and you know, this is a very unique moment uh, in terms, obviously, of the history of our country, the pandemic, everything that's taken place, uh, the recent change in the uh, administration of the White House, uh, the change in the guard at the FCC. You know, we have an acting chairwoman today that has for years made this one of her marquee uh, issues. You know, she has she has consistently weighed in on this and really taken it as taken the mantle, uh, for better or for worse. That this is one of her one of her passions, one of her topics. So, I think there is a uh, if there's ever momentum for these sorts of changes, uh, you know, it it is today. We've got a Biden administration that's very interested in in, in showing they're taking steps. You've got an acting head of the FCC that has a an issue near and dear to her heart that is right now uh, been, been funded by Congress and the, the typical issues that we struggle with when it comes to E-rate. Oh, extra money, it will require a higher fee on phone bills, so we don't wanna do that. Or the program doesn't support end user equipment. Those, those roadblocks have been removed. So today we've got, we've got funding, so we don't have to, have arguments about that. Uh, you know, we've got uh, the, the license from the FCC to provide support for these off-campus services, these off-campus devices. So the, many of the arguments have been reduced to, well, we don't want to set a precedent. <laughs> you know, but that, <laughs> that's a much weaker argument than just, well, we're, we're worried about the impact on the contribution factor this month versus well, we're worried where this will take us two years from now. Uh, you know, I, th I think so. A lot of the wind that's typically in our face is sort of at our back now. And, and it's really up to us to help seize that day, I think. That's a great, uh, a great statement. And I completely agree that this opportunity is uh, unique. And the significance of how this plays out will have ramification for years, definitely years. And as far as setting precedent, you know, we'll learn something here, something really valuable. We shouldn't consider it precedent unless it proves out to be valuable. You know, it should be, it should be precedent if something, we try something and it fails, that should be precedent. If it works, that should also be precedent just because it's a, a learning experience. Uh, Bob, closing remarks, we're at the hour. Yes, you know, libraries can do a lot of things now, Don, even though we don't know what the final rules and regulations are going to be like until probably a month from now, but especially for those libraries that either have hotspot, active hotspot lending programs now, or are thinking of doing that, it would behoove them to look at where the market is, uh, look at how many they think they need to cover their patrons and their given community, and start doing a lot of that work at this point in time. Like I said, uh, that's going to be needed regardless of how the application process plays out. So there's no reason to delay that uh, at this point. Very, very, very good point. And it's, a, it's the main action line, in addition to consider filing, that, that we recommend everybody take. John Windhausen, our, our leader, would you, would you give us the final word on the session today? Well, I, I will give a final word, but I, it's not a comprehensive one. It's really a, a hotspot related issue too. Uh, we know hotspots can be great in some locations, but they don't work in other locations. And the FCC needs to know about the cases where they don't work. Uh, hotspots do not provide that kind of long-term connectivity. If the cell phone signal is not good enough, they're not gonna do that much good for the community. Um, so we should not, the FCC should not put all its eggs in that hotspot basket, uh, if you will. And they need to hear from libraries that have tried hotspots and if they've worked, let them know that. If they haven't worked, then let them know that too because that's gonna open their minds to consider other technologies. Very and good. Just a quick, quick follow-up to that, Don. 
Absolutely. Hot spots to the, for the most part are low hanging fruit that work most of the time, but that is not, they are not a permanent solution by any means. And, and they don't go everywhere as far as that goes. There, you know, there are holes in the cell system, you know, where I live and, you know, downtown, we, we don't have a coverage. <laughs> and, and so it's not, a, it's not a complete solution. And I think uh, Bob's preparation point is exactly right. Every community is different. It's a unique combination of circumstances, environment, uh, wireless uh, technologies, uh, spectrum realities. All these things need to be evaluated you know, now so that you know what your environment is to help you plan. Um, uh, there was a question about recording. We'll have a recording of this session up in a day or two and that we will uh, devote our regular Friday session a week from tomorrow to filing, uh, filing uh, reply comments, which are due by the 23rd. So this will be uh, less than a week before that, but we want to motivate and try to encourage everybody to consider a simple filing. It's not that complicated and your voice is important, especially if you're doing projects like John was doing, Housing was describing, to relate your experiences and how they work will be really valuable in, in helping shape this. So I wanna thank everybody uh, for tuning in for this. And I'd like to ask everybody to uh, unmute if you could, please unmute everyone, everyone that's listening. Everyone that's listening. Unmute, unmute, unmute. unmute. <laughs> we wanna we want to give our, our speakers a, a round of applause. Thank you very much for this. It's great. Aloha. <laughs> right. We'll conclude with this and uh, we'll hang around a little bit uh, afterwards. We usually do, uh, but we'll stop the recording now. <laughs>